Amen. You may have your seats. Amen. I'm just going to get fixed here. Praise him. Praise him. Welcome, 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 everyone. I'm so happy to see our pastor and first lady. Amen. Woo! Thank you, God. Thank you, God. You know, I, I want to say, and ooh, look at, you know, all the children, they have the church. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. Amen. We give God thanks this morning. And Pastor and Lady Cheryl, as you were away, I want you to know that you had a proud flock back here. Yes. Amen. Yes. Proud group of people, proud to see our pastor and our first lady honor the word of God because we've often said it, we often talk about it, we often say that the work is not always just here at the church building, but it's out there where the people are at. So we give God praise and thanks this morning that he took them safely to a mission that he had declared, that he had ordained, that he has given them, they have served and they have completed their work work in that particular assignment. So we're grateful, we are inspired, we are encouraged by the work and the word of God. Yes. Amen. I just ask, Lord, that your people, God, would receive, would receive what it is you have for them this morning. Let us pray. Father, 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 we are so grateful this morning, Lord. You've brought us to a place, God, where we can come together, where we can worship, where we can call your name, where we can talk about, we can think about, we can live the word, God. Father, you have been so kind. We're here yet another Sunday, not by chance not because we made appointments, not because we said next week we're going to do this or going to do that. Father, we avail ourselves and we submit to the Holy Spirit this morning. Your anointing God that is present in your house, Lord. We pray, Father, I pray, Father, that you would undress your servant. Strip me, Lord any fleshly words, any fleshly terms. And Father, we're not going to fail to give you glory this morning, even through our worship, as we lifted our hands unto you. We come right now in the name of Jesus, bringing our heart, bringing our mind, bringing our body, bringing our soul. And Father, this is the day that you have made, and we're going to rejoice. We're going to be glad in it, because God, you say, you said, Lord, that you would never leave us nor forsake us. So Father, we testify today of your goodness. We testify today of your love. We testify today, God, of your Holy Spirit that lives and breathes within us. And Father, as your word goes forth in this house, on your platforms, technological platforms, as we walk away from this building today, if that be your desire, we pray, God, that your will be done and that you would receive the glory in everything that is said and done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. We give God thanks today once again. And I wasn't going to share this, but I think that I will. When you're working for the Lord, count on the enemy coming your way. And I'm not giving them any foothold, and I'm not giving them any glory. We're going to give God victory. Yes. Last night, I had such pain in my body, my back, my arm, and I had 
an experience with the arm not too long ago. And last night, and you know, and I, I had to laugh. I said, because I'm still getting up and I'm still going to church. And I'm still going to give the word. So, you know, I'll just, I literally, and I'm just, I traded sides bed with Deacon. I said, maybe if I sleep on the other side, it'll help me. I propped my arm up on two pillows. The pain was riding in my back. I couldn't lay down. I said, I'll sit in the chair, but I'll just start touching myself and praying and declaring the blood of Jesus and the healing power because we have power. We have power. And we need to use what God gives us. So I came to give a victory testimony that the Lord is good. His greatness, his greatness, his greatness. So I'm able to move around this morning. Minister Versi, I was like, yes, I can do it. Give God thanks. We give God thanks. Amen. So as we, as we go towards his word, know that there is something for every one of us, and the enemy does not want us to receive. But I declare in the name of Jesus, we shall, we shall be victorious and receive his word this morning. Amen. I want to read for you this morning from the book of Ezekiel. Starting at chapter 2, verse 1, and we're going to go to verse 3 and 3. Just 12 verses. It may sound like a lot, but it's just 12, and that's what the Lord has designed. Amen? And it reads, He said to me, Son of man, stand up on your feet, and I will speak to you. As he spoke, the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. He said, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious people, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, verse 6, do not be afraid of them. Do not be afraid of them or their words. Do not be afraid, though briars and thorns are all around you and you live among scorpions. Do not be afraid of what they say or be terrified by them, though they are rebellious people. You must speak my words to them, whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are rebellious. But you, son of man, listen to what I have to say to you. Do not rebel like the rebellious people. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Then I looked, and I saw a hand stretched out to me. And it was a great scroll, it was a scroll which he unrolled before me. And it was great because the Lord has been great to me. <laughs> On both sides of it were written words of lament and mourning and woe. Moving to chapter 3. And he said to me, son of man, eat what is before you, eat this scroll, then go and speak to the people of God. So I opened my mouth and he gave me the scroll to eat. Then he said to me, son of man, eat this scroll I am giving you and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, to God be glory for his word he's given us this morning. Amen. Amen. The message for today is entitled, Unorthodoxy Measures. Unorthodoxy Measures. Now, unorthodoxy can be described in terms of behavior, beliefs, or customs manifested or demonstrated that are contrary to what is generally accepted. You might say they were unconventional, unusual, 
out of the ordinary, radical, revolutionary methods or ways. And with that in mind, know that God will use and do whatever he chooses to get our attention or to direct our path, even if the path is unfamiliar or rocky. And he assures us through his word, through his teachings, and his mighty triune power, that he will get the glory in the end. Amen? Amen. And many often we hear people quote this phrase, God works in mysterious ways. While our faith or our experiences may inspire that conclusion, that phrasing is not scripture. It sounds good, but it's not God. And if we think about it, and although the happenings or results may be mysterious to us, God is working according to his plan. It's no mystery to God what's going on in our lives. It's no mystery to God what's happening in the world. Amen? Amen. Amen. Pastor Thomas, I, I, I give God praise and thanks for you. We often pass that. I actually had my first date with my husband at the USA Diner. Amen. So as we drive by, we often look, and I saw the church information. I said, oh, wow, thank God, now it's a church. So we give God thanks for you and your church. Amen. Amen. God works according to his plan, to his plan. And it's Isaiah who prophesies to God's people almost 150 years before Ezekiel, and he speaks the inspired God word regarding plans. And he says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, it tells us of the power and the magnitude of the God that we serve. And God says to his prophets, he says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. <laughs> Neither are your ways my ways. Hallelujah. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Our finite minds just can't figure God out. We must trust God even in the crazy times, even when it looks or feels strange or unorthodox. You're telling yourself, you know, God, this just can't be. What I'm seeing and I'm hearing, it doesn't even make any sense. 1 Corinthians 1 and 27 says, But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And he, he also said the spirit of discernment. Um, let me just go back a second. He said the foolish things of the wise, and it might be foolish to some. It's foolish to some. I didn't sleep, but I'm going to get through. Yes, Amen. Yes, yes. But the spirit of discernment, that's the key. That's the key for our journey, for our Christian relationship. So I remind us today to allow the Holy Spirit to tap in to us, because the Holy Spirit exists. We have to let it move in us so that we could be aligned with God's plan. So before we eat this message this morning, I just want to give you a little background and context for our reading this morning. And in our text, we meet Ezekiel, the priest turned prophet. 2 Kings 24 gives insight into the timeline where he was deported from Jerusalem and exiled to Babylon in 597 BCE, along with uh, King Jehoiachin and some 10,000 of Jerusalem's elite citizens. Nebuchadnezzar didn't come just for anybody. He came for the elite. And take note, the enemy, he all Always comes for God's best. We remember Job. He said to God, you know, well, what about Job? Can I touch him? Can I afflict him? Can I go after Job? Because Job was considered an upright and blameless man. And God allowed it. God allowed it. So if you're experiencing constant attacks from the enemy, tell yourself, I am one of God's elite. <laughs> Hallelujah. I I am one of the best, and God's got this. Amen? Repeat after me. I am one of God's elite. Hallelujah. That's right, Pastor. And God's got it. God's got it. That's what the enemy's coming for. If you're not doing nothing for Christ, he ain't worried about you. You're no challenge. He's coming for God's best. Come on. Amen. Amen. Ezekiel was the only Israelite prophet to carry out his ministry 
entirely outside of Israel's homeland in a strange place. Circumstance that was different from every other prophet. So don't feel strange if you're being singled out or you're the first one in your family called to teach or you're the first one to go to college or to open a business or to pursue a God calling. Someone, someone has to be the pioneer. And it's not an easy assignment, it's not an easy journey, but someone, the one who God has called, must do it. And God has a higher plan for those that he calls. He has a higher plan for your life. Ezekiel expected to carry out the usual Levitical priestly temple responsibilities. When they turned age 30 in the Levitical line, they got assignments in the temple. So uh, Ezekiel just figured, because that's how life goes, that he would be assigned to, to uh, managing some of God's tasks in the temple. But that's not how it went. That's not how it went. Little did he know his life would change, that the temple would soon be destroyed and he would live in exile. Indeed, it was not the plan he had for his life, but God's ways are not our ways. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The unorthodox measures become our reality, and we must trust the process and the plan. Amen? God would call Ezekiel in a vision to be a prophet to speak to his stubborn people while he was in captivity. Tell it. While he was in captivity. It doesn't matter where our feet land. It matters that we can listen and hear the word of God. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ezekiel had been deported to Babylon. It reminds me of the Apostle Paul wrote many of his epistles, his letters from the prison cell. Glory to God. Glory to God. God works everywhere. He is omnipresent. He knows what's going on. And he has a plan for our lives. And if we look through Ezekiel's lens regarding our text, we want to highlight four things this morning. Four things that our text tells us. Number one, Ezekiel was physically far away from the temple. Jerusalem was about 900 miles from Babylon. He had gone a long way from the temple. To help us put that in perspective, because I'm crazy like that, I had to look up some cities and see how far they were from us. So to get it, if you were to go to Tallahassee, Florida, that's about 900 miles from New York. That's how far Ezekiel was from the temple, from Jerusalem. Number two, there's no opportunity for Ezekiel to serve as a priest because that's what it looks like, as would be the norm at age 30, a descendant in the Levitical line. Number three, he sees himself in completely unfamiliar surroundings. A foreign way of life is upon him. And number four, lastly, if we continue to look through the lens of Ezekiel, he sees that God's glory, regularly understood and perceived as being available through the temple in Jerusalem, is no longer available to him. So he thinks. Saints, even when we are, we are on roads that we've never walked on before, or there are unknowns, there's some dangerous curves and turns up ahead, or some seemingly dead ends or actions we feel ill-equipped to handle, remember in your spirit, God knows and he has a plan. And his ways, they're not our ways. Yeah but he knows the way. He knows the way. So as Ezekiel was told not to be afraid, we shall not be afraid of the path that God has given us to walk. Amen? Amen. Amen. In Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel begins to share his encounter, his victory from God, and he says, while I was among the exiles in the, by the Kabar River, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. 
Hallelujah. I thought about dawn in Revelation as God opens his eyes to see things. Hallelujah. Ezekiel said, as I was among the exiles in captivity, sitting on the side of the river, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Hallelujah. In this vision, Ezekiel says he sees, in this vision, he, he uh, enumerates what he sees. He sees the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. He's looking up, he's seeing this vision, and he says he sees the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And at the end of that chapter, chapter 1 and verse 28, he says the appearance. It looks like God's glory. But it can't be, because up in Babylon, the temple's in Jerusalem, that's 900 miles away. It looks like it, Lord. Ezekiel's in a quandary. How can this be the glory of God when it's back in Jerusalem? But we know how. We know how. Matthew 19, 26, the latter part of it says, with God, all things are possible. It doesn't matter where we are. It matters that God sees us and that we've stood up and we're out of tension to receive him. It looks like God's glory, he says. And Psalm 115 and 3 says, our God is in heaven and he does whatever pleases him. He does whatever pleases him. Share a clip with you all uh, right here and then we continue. Uh, this is actually something we were going to use last Tuesday, but the Lord, the Holy Spirit nudged me to share it today. It's just three minutes. And I want to share this clip because we'll find ourselves in places. Doesn't mean God doesn't know where we're at. So if we could share that clip. Amen. My name is William Jones. I've been here at the Carol Can Vance Unit. Up? I've been incarcerated for three and a half years. And Can you today, just start it over? Because the volume was a little low, if you don't mind. Thank you. My name is William Jones. I've been here at the Carol Vance Unit. I've been incarcerated for three and a half years. And today, I'm about to go home. I got here at about 5.20 on the morning of December 2nd, 2015. I came through the gate and the first person that greeted me was about six foot five. His name was Antonio Sierra. And he told me, he said, God bless you and welcome to Carol Vance. In the, in the process of about five minutes, I had five guys tell me, God bless you and welcome to Carol Vance. There's no other unit like this unit. After I began to uh, come into the building and spend a couple of days here, I saw that what they were receiving was something real. Uh, there was nothing fake about what was happening in these guys' lives. And it was, it was just transparent to me that Man, I need what these guys got. So immediately I begin to plug into the Prison Fellowship Academy. All these programs to just help you see your thinking errors, see your faults, and encourage you to want to become a better man. It's, it's nothing like I've ever seen in my life. And I really think it's something that, you know, as guys venture out of, from, from these walls, from Prison Fellowship Academy, that we should be doing these things on the outside too. There is more guys in this Prison Fellowship Academy that are free inside than I've ever witnessed on the outside of these gates. The time that I spent here has not been in vain. It's allowed me to see God in so many different areas of my life. And in the relationship that I have with him now, I don't only see what he's doing now, I've seen what he's already had been doing in my life. Just the fact that out of 150,000 inmates in Texas, out of 300, they chose me to come here. And this is one of the first things in my life that I've completed. I, I've been on probation before, didn't finish it. I've been on parole before, I didn't finish it. But this right here, I finished it. There's just no reason that I should not get out here and succeed. I've got numbers from everybody. I've got addresses. I've got churches that I can go to. So the fellowship doesn't end here. It transcends outside these gates. I'm a better man. I'm a better father. I'm a better son. I'm a better husband. But more than anything, I'm a better child of God. My relationship with God is first and foremost in my life now. And I've never put him first, but now he's first because because of him, I stand before you today as a man that's about to be released 
So I, I'm, I'm just blessed, man. I'm overwhelmed. I'm excited today. Uh, if I keep talking about this like I am, I'm probably going to break down in tears. I'm about to, I've had these white clothes on for three and a half years. I'm about to get out of these clothes. I got a box of clothes waiting at that back gate. I'm about to eat, man. I'm about to, to hug my wife and not be told that it's time to stop. I'm about to hold my kids and they not have to walk away from me. It's time. This is my season. God told me this would happen if I trusted him. And I trust him. I'm going home. Doesn't matter where we are. Doesn't matter where we are. And as children of God, and I can only think of your Panama mission, Pastor and Lady Cheryl, that he's going to take us to places that people are going to know who God is. So this word that we're eating this morning, this is for us to live. This is for us to eat and to digest and to hold on to and to let it go unto those who are in need, who know less, who are immature in Christ. And as we're talking about Ezekiel, he was in Babylon. He was in Babylon thinking that was it. But the glory of the Lord, the glory of the Lord was going to meet him right there in Babylon. Amen. God wanted Ezekiel to know that the Almighty God had called him, and just because Ezekiel wasn't in his usual place, just because he was far away from the regular meeting place in the temple, it would not stop God's plan to call his prophet. God allowed Ezekiel to understand through a vision that his glory was with him. His glory had come to his prophet. God will move on our behalf no matter where we may be according to his will. So by the end of chapter 1, Ezekiel is prostrate before the Lord, face down on the ground. And our text this morning says, the almighty God, the sovereign Lord, Yahweh, speaks to Ezekiel and he says, son of man, stand up on your feet. Stand up on your feet and I will speak to you as he spoke the spirit came into him and he raised my feet and I heard him speaking to me God wants us to get up so we can hear him hallelujah hallelujah he says stand up and I'll speak to you Jesus, son of man in the Old Testament is a synonym for humanity and mankind, and God refers to Ezekiel by this term more than 90 times. And the phrase is believed to mark the distance separating the prophet as human who has limits. We are limited from Jehovah who is limitless, and he calls him son of man. Know your place with God. Hallelujah. Know who the almighty power is where your resource is, the one that we tap into, the one that gave breath in our lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The triune God gives Ezekiel, he gives him four instructions to prepare him for this exilic prophetic call because he's still going to be a prophet in captivity. And the first thing he says, he says, stand up stand up. Ezekiel was being called to a new level. Hallelujah. And in order for him to receive the oracle of God, to be appointed as an intercessor on behalf of God's people, God required his full address. God required his full attention. God required his vertical posture in the name of Jesus. God wants our undivided attention. There are times, yes, there are times when we've got to be on our knees. There are times he wants us to stand as individuals, as the body of Christ, and as the church, hallelujah. But he wants us to stand up when he calls. When he calls, hallelujah. Be ready for the assignment. Be ready, because if you're standing, that's when you can take off. You can't take off from the ground, because you first got to get up. So if you're already standing up, you'll already be ready to take off and take on your assignment. Hallelujah. Number two, what he says in this text, he says, I'm sending you. It's me, the almighty. 
Almighty God, the Yahweh, the Elohim, the Alpha, the Omega, the I am that I am that I am. I am sending you. Hallelujah. It's not your neighbor. It's not your sister. It's not your brother. It is the great I am that has a path and a plan for us. Amen. Hallelujah. Ezekiel would go on to an obstinate, stubborn, rebellious group of people bent on doing things their way no matter what any prophet had to say to them. They'd already heard from Isaiah. They'd already heard from Jeremiah. Ezekiel, he was coming with the same thing. They were obstinate. They were stubborn. They didn't want to hear. And God told Ezekiel, he said, I'm going to make your head as hard as stone because you're dealing with some hard heads. So I'm going to make your head harder than the stone that those hard heads are. Hallelujah, because I know you're going to be up against some things with my people, because I know my sons and my daughters, I know my children, hallelujah, but I'm sending you to a place anyhow, anyway, and if God sends us, we know he has equipped us. Glory to God. Glory to God. Number three, he said, don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. How are you going to be afraid with God with you? Do not be afraid. And just as when Israel entered the promised land and had to face so many enemies, God told Moses in Deuteronomy 3 and 22, he says, you must not fear them. You must not fear them for the Lord your God himself. He fights for you. He's fighting for us already. The battle's already been won. The, the victory already took place at Calvary. We know God has got the fight covered for us. God told Ezekiel, he said, even though the briars and the thorns are all around you and you're living among scorpions, do not fear. I don't care where you live. I don't care how bad that pain in your back is. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what health condition. I don't care what job condition. Just walk in my assignment and do not be afraid because I am with you. I am with you in that operating room. I am with you on that job. I am with you on that bus. I am with you in that vehicle. I am with you as you see even right now. Hallelujah. Do not fear. Do not fear. And even though the world presents family and social discord, crime and economic disparities and racism and war, and the, the world seems to want nothing to do with God, we don't have to live in fear. We don't have to live in fear. Luke 10, 19 is a valuable scripture that gives us encouragement. He says, behold, behold, I give unto you power hallelujah to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you hallelujah so we have nothing to be fearful of he's given us the power he's given us the power glory to God the fourth thing we want to know that is uh, in our text it says and this is the part that I love he told Ezekiel he said, open your mouth and eat. And I pondered on that for quite some time. Open your mouth and eat. Now, all the unorthodox things that God could have said to Ezekiel, this is one of the strangest. And I'm going to start at, at uh, chapter 2, verse 9. It says, then I looked and I saw a hand stretched out to me. And it was a scroll, which he unrolled before me. And on both sides of it were written words of lament, mourning, and woe. And he goes on to say, eat what is before you. Son of man, eat this scroll I'm giving you and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it, that is the obedience of Ezekiel. And it tasted sweet as honey in my mouth. Ezekiel had eaten the woe, he had eaten the lament, he had tasted the mourning of the people, and yet he says, it's sweet as honey in my mouth. <laughs> Eat what is before you. Eat what I give you, not what the world gives you. Eat what I give you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Eating the material pages of the Bible or the scroll, that would not have been any spiritual good. But using the figure of eating its nourishment to provide strength, 
and it can do us great good. God's servants should receive God's word as if they are actually eating it. Eating the scroll speaks of many things that should mark our reception of God's inspired word. See, we can't just walk around, start quoting scriptures, and, you know, you get in front of people who don't know scripture, so when you say a scripture, you know, you think you look like somebody. <laughs> Amen? Amen? But you ain't saying nothing because you're speaking to somebody that doesn't know. You should be teaching. Praise God. But when we're eating the word... We'll know how to serve the word. When we're eating the word, we're taking it into our bodies. Eating the scroll speaks of many things. It's a deliberate, obedient action. I choose to receive the word of God. It shows my readiness. I've stood up to attention. It shows my readiness to take in what God is giving. Because he says, I give you. Eat what I give you. There is an internal reception of the word that we eat. Hallelujah. It's a constant and repetitious chewing. We're chewing on the word in the morning. We're chewing on the word when we get in the shower. We're chewing on the word as we're driving. We're chewing and feasting on the word of God all day as we eat. Hallelujah. There's a process of digestion. Letting it settle in our spirit. Glory to God. Talking about eating. Ezekiel ate the scroll. And we have to eat the bitter and the sweet. We have to eat what God gives us. It's not pretty all the time. Ezekiel had to eat the woes. He had to eat the laments. He had to eat the mourning. But even so, when he digested what God gave him, because God gave him the assignment to speak to the exiles while he was in captivity, he gave him the word to eat. He came on over to Ezekiel, hallelujah, and his glory shone, and he gave him an inspirational word. The process of digesting the word settles in our spirit, and there's a sweetness. There's a peace that only God can provide. Glory to God. And this scroll, as I said, I believe I told you this earlier, normally it's just written on one side. This scroll that Ezekiel had to eat had words on both sides. I mean, it was double trouble, Amen. double trouble. Amen. The road, the assignment was going to be extra hard, extra hard. Amen? Amen? Ezekiel would carry the weight on behalf of the people, yet despite how burdensome, despite how difficult it was to eat this message. So he digested it and he realized that God's justice is better than injustice. Right. You know, sometimes we look ahead and we see the things that are before us and we look at the challenges and say, oh, there's not enough time in the day. I don't know how I'm going to do this. And God told me to do this. God's justice is better than injustice. Amen. With that in mind, remember to eat the bitter along with the sweet. Because when it gets inside, when it's internalized, yes. God will make it all sweet for us. Amen. John the Baptist he ate honey. It sustained him in the wilderness. He ate locusts and honey. God promised his people that he would take them to a land, the promised land, filled with milk and honey, overflowing with milk and honey. Yes, there was going to be some wilderness challenges. Yes, there were going to be some turns. Yes, there were going to be some things. There were going to be some people who was going to be lost that wasn't going to make it to the promised land. But he said, the place that I'm taking you to has milk and honey. Amen. Glory to God. Glory. Only God. Only God. Hallelujah. Proverbs 24 and 13 and 14 speaks to honey. It says, eat honey, my son, for it is good. Honey from the comb is sweet to your taste. Know also that wisdom is like honey for you. If you find it, there is future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our disappointments, our challenges can turn to honey because God will give us the wisdom. Hallelujah. And know that you're not alone in admitting to the promise. Amen. I was at the reason pause because I was looking for my phone and I can't find it. I said, I pray it doesn't go off. So wherever it is. <laughs> Amen. We know we're not alone in submitting to the process. We're submitting to the actions of the call. 
Many unusual, unorthodox things have taken place in the Bible to open our eyes to the uniqueness of God's hand. Yes. Some people in situations where it didn't look good, but it was good in the end. Now, Moses and Aaron, they're told to go to, Moses is told to go to Pharaoh, let the people go, let God's people go. God said up front, Pharaoh's going to resist you. He's not gonna. He's not gonna do what I'm telling you to go do. So, God sends His servant for an assignment that He already knows is a challenge. Not only does He know it's a challenge, He gets there, and Pharaoh, of course, resists. And then God, because He's God, takes not one, not two. Not three, but ten plagues. So Moses has to keep going back and to keep going back, and he has to journey, and he has to understand that Pharaoh, his assignment, this is not going to be an easy one. What you're eating right now is going to be a hard one to digest. It's going to be hard to go down, but you're going to go to Pharaoh. And I'm giving you Aaron. It says in, in, uh, in Exodus there, it says that Aaron was his prophet. Because Aaron was going to speak for him. So they went over and over and over. And finally, we know that the people were released. But God wanted to remove any doubt, any doubt. Because even the first three plagues, he allowed the enchanters of Pharaoh to, to work right along there with Moses. It's like, oh, we could work and we could do this too. You ain't doing nothing. But by, by plague number six and plague number seven, when it was getting really tough, there was nothing they could do against God's servant. And so God wanted to remove any doubt. Out. Even Pharaoh's people started telling Pharaoh, you know, it's his God knows exactly what he's talking about, and that's the God we need to be listening to. But of course, Pharaoh was stubborn and obstinate, and God wanted Moses to know, he wanted Pharaoh to know, he wanted the people to know that I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one who gave you the promise. Amen? Then we have Joshua, who took over after Moses, and these are the unorthodoxy things that, that God has done. They don't seem to, to fall into a, like a practical, reasonable way to do things, but God is not practical and reasonable. He's outstanding. He's amazing. He's God. Amen? So he can be practical, he can be reasonable, but he chooses to be great. Hallelujah. So that we can see, that we can distinguish just as God said to Ezekiel 90 plus times, son of man, son of man, son of man, your son of man, know your place. I am God. Amen. So he, he tells Joshua that I'm going to give you the city of Jericho, but you got to walk around seven times. Once a day for six days, six days, walk around Jericho, the walled city, the city with gates. I want you to walk around the city where, where you met Rahab and she hid the spies. I want you to walk around that place and I want you to bring the priests and I want them to have their trumpets. There's whole entourage of people that are going to walk around day one, day two, day six, and then on day seven. God tells him, he said, now I want you all to blow those horns. And when you blow those horns, when you follow my instruction, when you are obedient, I'm going to let the walls fall down and you shall overtake Jericho. Now, you know God could have just did like that and told Jericho walls to fall down. These things are for us. These things are for us. God uses these extreme situations, these unorthodoxy ways to get our attention to define and to know that he is God. Because these things that are happening, no one else can do them. No one else can do them. Amen? Beautiful. Hallelujah. Then um, another unorthodox moment as the Israelites were in the wilderness, manna and quail is falling from the sky. The food is coming out the sky. You have to laugh, Sister Rhonda. I see you because you say, look at God. Look at the way he comes to his people. Manna and quail. And he said, and he, and he tells you how to do it too. He said, now you're only going to take enough for today. You're not taking no extra. Just enough. I provide everything you need. So he gave manna and quail for the day. And he said, on the sixth day, take double because then on day seven, as you're resting, you're going to have something to eat. God always makes a way. He always makes provision. God allowed a donkey to speak to his master to save his life. God told Naaman to dip into the Jordan seven times. Not once, not twice, not three times, seven times. Do it until I tell you. I said seven times. So if you get up at five, you're not going to be healed. The leprosy is not going to be gone. When God gives an instruction, he wants us to 
carry it out all the way to the end. Jonah was told to go to Nineveh, but he's so smart, he want to go to Tarshish. So he gets on a ship, and he, the people on the ship say he got to go, so they throw him overboard. Throw him overboard. So he really should, should have drowned or died in the sea, but God, in his infinite wisdom, provides the fish. Now, what story, how are you going to tell somebody, God put a fish out there to get Jonah so that he would live? He's been thrown in the sea. He's supposed to die. And then when the fish get him, he's supposed to be chewed up. God does things his way. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. Start expecting God to work miracles in a way like you've never, ever experienced before because he's not going to do it the same way. He's not going to show you the same thing. Hallelujah. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead for everyone to see the Lord's power. Jesus was the most contrary, most rebellious uh, a prophet, individual, son of God, because what Jesus did was contrary to the land. Everywhere he walked, the Pharisees want to know, well, who gave you authority to do that? Who said you can do that? Who said you could eat on the Sabbath day? Who told you? Who, who, who? So Jesus was a rebellious Yes, he was a nonconformist in a good sense of the word, amen? Because he couldn't come the way the land was already designed because nobody's paying attention. You got to step out of your box. You got to let God move. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ezekiel in his third vision in his book in chapter 37, and I want to read some of that. He says, um, he says to Ezekiel, because there's a valley of bones in this chapter, Bones that represent deceased, that re represent the dead. And these bones are atop the ground. They're not buried in the ground. They're sitting above the ground. So it indicates that whoever it was that died, they thought them not even worthy enough to bury them. That the bones were just atop the ground. And uh, in this text, it says, son of man, can these bones live? As if God doesn't know the answer. And I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know found a good way out. He said, you know, Lord. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make, I will make, I'm uh, sorry, breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. I am the Lord. Ezekiel, in this vision, he sees these dry bones, a situation that looks completely, completely dead. But the Lord said, I just have to blow breath. I just have to blow breath. And then the phalanges started coming together, the toes and the ankle bone and the femur and the humerus bone and the extremities, God, and the skull and the ribs and everything started coming together. Then the connective tissue, the, 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 the tendons brought the body together and a skeleton was formed. And then God put breath into the skeleton after the flesh was upon the body and the dry bones lived. What bones, what bones are, are lying dead in your life? What gifts are lying dormant waiting to be revived? What gifts are you sitting on like these dry bones that Ezekiel saw in the vision in the valley that the Lord put breath into and they came to life? What are we sitting on? Let your toes, let your extremities, let your gift, let your heart come alive. The church, the church survives on gifts. And if our gifts are dormant, if our gifts are as dry bones, we're not living up to what God has given us. Dry bones, dry bones. Our valley of dry bones can be revived and live with God's plan in place. God is the restorer. He's the healer, he's the master, and he will take our dead, dry bones and bring them to life. God uses some unorthodoxy measures to prepare us and to save us. And as we prepare to close, and I pray, I, I, I ask the Lord to time this in a manner 
that we didn't have to be long-winded because the word is the word is the word. He told Ezekiel to eat the word. Eat the word. So as I prepare to close, I want us to remember that we can't put margins or limits on God. We cannot fail to listen for his call. And in that call is instruction. No matter where we end up, whether it's in a jail cell, whether it's living with a relative that you didn't even want to live with, but you're down so far, you've got to make some hard decisions. Minister Lorraine talked to us about decisions last week. Amen. So no matter, no matter where we end up, God is omnipresent and he extends that olive branch to those who choose to submit, to ask for forgiveness, and to have the breath of life. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with us, not wanting anyone, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So in conclusion, when the Lord speaks, listen, whether it's in a dream, a shower, through nature, or even a building falling, as we saw last Thursday in New London, Connecticut, a church building built in 1850, steeple atop the building, came crashing down in seconds, crashed right through the middle as if it had come right through the center of our sanctuary, crashed down, and the church had to be destroyed, dismantled because it was considered unsafe. God is speaking aloud to the church. He's speaking to the church, and he is doing whatever it takes before it's too late to get our vertical attention. Glory to God. Glory to God. When he says go, know that he has equipped you. Expect that the call can be outside of your comfort zone. This is cute. This is nice. We're around familiar people. It's a little easier. Step outside the walls. Go to Panama. Go to South Africa. Go to the places where the work is difficult, where the people don't have cushy pews, where they don't have four walls, they got a tent or some material hanging on a tree bar. That's where the work is. Go into the homeless shelter. Go into the prison where our brother is. And I, I, I marveled that he said he wore white for three years. I said, Lord, you're talking about purity. You brought him into a place in the jail of purity. And he said he saw more free men inside the jail than he's ever seen on the outside. That's what he said. And as he got to the gate as the entryway of where he was going to be captive, where he had been deported to from Texas, he met the people who said, God bless you. God came to where he was. Hallelujah. The glory of God came to Ezekiel. And God will come to us where we are if we want to receive him. So we have to be honest with ourselves. Expect the call to be outside of our comfort zone. Eat the woes. Eat the lament. Eat the sickness. We even have to eat the death and the unemployment. We have to eat that because life brings about many things. And, and I thought of Trish this morning. She would have said to me, life be lifing. That's what she would have told me. Amen. So as life is lifing, eat the word of God. Eat as Ezekiel ate what God gave him in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God is doing some unorthodox things in this time. 
And uh, we have to cooperate with what he's doing. Yes. Amen? We have to cooperate with what he's doing. Because these are some different times that we're living in. And we cannot be stuck in our little, little box, so to speak. We have to flow with God. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 18, he says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. People are seeing the gospel as foolishness, but they're perishing. They're perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Amen? Amen. It's the power of God. Further on, he goes on to say, but God chooses the, chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and he chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things, amen, of the world to despise the things that are nothing. As God's people, we have to cooperate with, with the Lord. We have to cooperate with God. And I've been watching the season that we're in. Over the last few, uh, two years, I've seen God, been watching God, and it's good when you, when you get away from the usual, the norm, and you take a good bird's eye look at what God is doing. And one of the things that God spoke to me clearly about this past week, especially, is that we need to prepare our children for the future. We, need, we have a generation today that is growing up that doesn't know the Lord. And it's not God's fault. It's our fault. Yeah, we know COVID came in, put a, lot, put a stop to a lot of things that we had in place, that he put in place. But, we, but this is all the plot of Satan. Satan is doing his work. Satan is an expert at his job. And as we said over and over, he doesn't sleep, all right? And I'm sure my wife this this morning, he doesn't have respect for us, and I have less respect for him. We, we, we put him on notice. We have less respect for Satan. People don't want to come to church on Sunday morning. They don't want to come to Sunday school on Sunday mornings. Yeah. The mentality that the enemy, and I'm not preaching over your message, I'm just showing what the Lord is laying in my heart right now. The mentality of Christians today is that, I, wouldn't, I don't want to say Sunday school, but teaching children the basics of God's word is something of the past. And this is why the enemy is using this space, this space, to infiltrate, to bombard their minds with every sort of garbage. Yes. So now we have a generation, as in the book of, of uh, Joshua, Judges, sorry, that didn't know the Lord. We have a generation today that does not know the Lord. Right. Don't blame COVID. Right. And I, I, I was talking to the Lord, I said, Lord, but people don't want to come in for, they don't want to come to worship on Sunday mornings. Furthermore, come for Sunday school. I'm talking to you now as pastor. People don't want to come to church to worship. They rather sit and watch their TVs. I know that there's some folks who are out of state and they're watching right now. You can't come because you're in Jersey. You can't come because you're in North Carolina. You can't come because you're in Barbados. You can't come because you're in Canada. But there are people around the corners from the church who don't want to come into the church. But they come knocking on the door when, when someone dies. Right. They'll come knocking on the doors when there's a crisis. Right. They'll come knocking on the doors when they want to get married. Yeah. All right? But it is even more important to teach our children the word of God. Yeah. And I said, Lord, how are we going to get this done? How are we going to get this done? I was talking to one of the elders yesterday. And I said, Deacon, we might have to have Sunday school on Zoom if necessary. The problem is now the parents are going to have to rise up and get their children ready for Sunday school on Zoom if necessary. And then they'll have to come to church. We're talking about 
or unorthodoxy, not orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is the traditional, the regular, the norm. Unorthodoxy is the word that came this morning. I'm just following what's being shared. We're going to have to implement unorthodox methods. We have, we have educators in the house of God today. We're going to have to implement unorthodox methods to get the word of God into the lives of our children. And, and it's the younger generation that I'm most, most concerned about. It's the children that I'm most concerned about because they want to erad erad eradicate everything that has to do with God, everything that has to do with our history, and everything that has to do with the coming of Christ. Let's bow our hearts before the Lord. I don't want to extend the service longer than necessary. But I received this message today personally. And I don't think anyone is here that is not saved this morning. So this message is not for the, saved, for, the, for the unsaved. This message is for the church. And I want to ask you a question. Have you ever considered individuals in the scriptures who did not cooperate with the plan of God but experience the consequences of not cooperating with God's plans? Are you aware of anyone like that? You don't want to be one of those, right? I don't want to be one of those. And if you're here today, you'll say, Pastor, I want to cooperate with God's plans. Whatever he has designed for me, it may not be the regular, it may not be the norm, but I want to cooperate with what God wants me to do, what, where God wants me to be. I want you to stand to your feet right now. I'm going to cooperate with God's plans for my life. I want to cooperate with God's plans. Lord, you see your people as, this, as we stand before you. And God, even that you're opening our eyes to see that we're living in different times. We're living in changed times. We stand before you, God, as a congregation who understands that the ways of God are not the ways of man. Your ways are beyond our comprehension. Your ways at times are beyond our understanding, our ability to resolve in our minds what you're doing. And so, Lord, we stand before you as a church today, recognizing that you are so sovereign. Your word reminds us that you're not willing that any, you're not desirous that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Lord, you desire, you've commissioned us to train our children, to teach our children, to teach the word of God, to call people from lives of darkness and being lost into your marvelous light. And God, we come today to surrender our lives to you, to give you our hearts, to give you our abilities, to give you our resources. I pray today, oh God, for every person standing in this congregation, everyone who stands, Lord, acknowledging that we desire to cooperate with you. I pray, oh God, that you will give your people a fresh revelation of your perfect will for our lives. Give us greater clarity, O oh God, in what you designed, what you desire us to do, Lord, in these last days. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, it's against spiritual wickedness in high places. And Satan, right now we identify your plans. We call out your plots to lull the church, the body of Christ to sleep. We curse your plans today in the name of Jesus. Lord, right now I call forth men and women, Lord, who will be willing to make the sacrifices, who will be willing to go all the way for Jesus Christ. For Lord, you suffered and you bled and you died, Lord, but thank God you rose again on the third day. You completed your assignment on our behalf. 
And so, Lord, I pray for strength for this church, for every body, Lord God, every member of this church. I pray, oh God, you will open the eyes of our understanding, remove the scales from our eyes. We will come to understand what is necessary in these final days. For we are truly living in unorthodox times. Times when we have to come out of our box, out of our comfort zone, and go the extra mile. Times when we will be awakened early in the morning and called to prayer, called to meditate on your word, called, called to listen to your voice. Help us to be sensitive, Lord. Help us to be not so consumed with the, the things that are happening, Lord God, even on social media. Help us to be not so uh, distracted, Lord God, by the events that are unfolding around us. But we lose sight, that we lose sight of what is most important. Help us to make the most important things that which is most important today. And Lord, we give you thanks for doing all these things in Jesus' name. And everyone says, Come on, let's give the Lord some praise today. Hallelujah. 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 All to Jesus. All to Jesus. This is the call for us to surrender everything to the Lord. Hallelujah. In these different times, in these changed, they're not changing, they are changed times. <laughs> Even as we look at the election cycle, <laughs> everything is different. No debates. The loser's the winner. The winner's the loser. Come on. Everything has changed. And God wants us to, you know, you know what this church was birthed on? The simple word, what? You're forgetting. I have to remind you more often. This church was birthed on one word, change. You remember now, right? Change. So these are unorthodox times. All to Jesus. Jesus Come on, let's sing. I Hallelujah. 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 With every head bowed and every eye still closed. Maybe you're here and you are in a place where you have never surrendered your life completely to the Lord. You've been coming to church. You've been attending services. But you have never said, Jesus, be my Lord. Be the Lord of my life. Be my Savior. And even as you examine what is happening around us, you know that these times are not normal. And so you do not, tr you, would, you, you wouldn't dare trust your life in your own hands. But you're willing to say, Lord, take my life, take my all, take my possessions, take my family. Lord, I give you my will. I give you everything because I trust you. Slip your hand up right where you are. I want to pray a special prayer for you. Is there one person who would say, yes, pastor, I need to put my all in your care. Everything that I am, that I have. I want to trust you completely with everything. You haven't yet done so. But you want to do so today. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Okay. 
Praise God. We give God thanks for this precious word that the Lord has strengthened Reverend Sandra to bring today a word that is timely, timely in this season that we're in. And I pray each person has received their portion. I got my portion. Amen. And even though, Lord, we pray that you will replenish what she has poured out to us today. Strengthen her body. Cover her, Lord, in your precious blood. Remember Deacon Sam, Lord God, even this week. Strengthen this family. Cover them in your precious blood. Remember those who are challenging their bodies, oh God, from this assembly. Perform miracles. Show yourself to be mighty. Show yourself to be strong. Bless those, Lord, who are with us on YouTube today, wherever they are. I pray, God, that they would have received what you have prepared for them today as well. And Lord, we thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, it's a pleasure to have Pastor Thomas with us today. God bless you for visiting with us. God bless each and every one of you. Have a wonderful day, a week in the Lord. God bless you.